Um, you're going to. Um, we will have a second change. We will ask Rick and Saloni because you have a flight afterwards. And I would like to ask you to speak to the innovation factor, how to introduce nanomedicine products into the market. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry that I'm going to miss the discussion portion of this, uh, but maybe not too sorry. Um, uh, I, I would, I'll be in the uncomfortable position of sharing the table with, with two Nobel laureates, uh, senior regulator, and the president of the society for which we're all discussing. So, uh, so, so uh, Bayat asked me to talk for uh, <coughs> 10 minutes on how to bring nanomedicine to the market. Um, and I wish I could do that in one slide that says, you know, find good science that will, that will cure disease and <coughs> sell said drug. Unfortunately, uh, it's not that simple. Uh, you know, we all, everyone in this room, you know, thinks about the, uh, the risks associated with, with science. And so, so in, in a lot of respects, that's a very difficult part, but, but, uh, but a knowable set of risks, uh, maybe the, the, the hardest but simplest uh, part of the process. Uh, it, is, it is unfortunately much more complicated uh, than that. Um, uh, so I'm president and CEO of Arrowhead Research Corporation. Uh, we are a uh, publicly traded nanomedicine company. Um, we have assembled a comprehensive set of RNAi platforms um, uh, that's based on nanotechnology, and we have we have really two columns of value. One is in RNAi chemistry, and one is in the delivery. The delivery is where the the real nanotechnology uh, happens. Uh, we have a hepatitis B program that uh, that makes these, or at least that is intended to make these platforms uh, tangible. Um, that's our pipeline. It doesn't look so good there, but in any event, we have uh, a lead program in hepatitis B called ARC520. Uh, we are in a phase two study there right now. We we anticipate reading out the phase two A next quarter, uh, and then we'll start a phase two B at the end of the year. Uh, we have a, a program just underneath that that will that will be at IND uh, at the end of this year. It's against uh, liver disease associated with alpha one atrypsin deficiency, and then several programs underneath that. And I say this just so you know where I'm coming from with respect to to uh, to how I view bringing nanomedical uh, products to market. So we are all in this room in a difficult at best, terrible at worst business. Um, Biology is difficult, and we never know as much as we want to know. Uh, most therapeutics don't work, and if that were the entire story, that'd be hard enough. The uh, the the, uh, the harder part of the story is that you don't really know that 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 your product doesn't work until you've spent tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we start out with, you know, with a with a large amount of basic research. Only a small amount of that. Uh, is, uh, is pushed into translational research. Only a small amount of that is pushed into clinical programs, and then a vanishingly small uh, trickle of products come out of that into the marketplace. Um, now, for, for small molecule biotechnology, uh, these steps are well understood, and there are a variety of people who are expert uh, in them. So while it's, a, it's an awful business, um, um, we have we have now you know quite quite a number of years um, to understand the, the steps uh, to get to marketplace. Uh, so how about nanomedicine? Well, it's it's a bit more difficult. It's tricky. Uh, the basic requirements are of course the same, um, but some of these requirements are going to be more difficult because these are new technologies and because we are approaching disease in in a, in a new and different way. Of course, we start out with non-clinical studies. Uh, uh, you know, showing showing efficacy or activity across multiple models. Uh, that's really quite similar to, to what we do in, in uh, small molecule development programs. Uh, we then have to get over small scale synthesis. Uh, if you're lucky enough to do that, uh, you need to find capital to continue to fund the program. Uh, if you're lucky enough to do that, uh, push into GLP toxicology uh, studies and manufacturing to support those. Uh, after that, of course, uh, um, one needs to, to scale up a bit and figure out how to make this compound under GMP uh, conditions um, and then find KOLs who will wave the flag with you. Uh, that's important, of course, not only for clinical programs but for the follow-on uh, uh, finance that you're going to need. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get all through these steps, uh, you then uh, interact with regulators to, to enable you to start clinical programs once you're there. Uh, of course, you've got, you've got enrollment issues and, and clinical strategies. Uh, those are, of course, different in nanomedical 
uh, therapeutics than in small molecules, or they certainly can be. Uh, and then you've got scale-up synthesis. Uh, that is no uh, simple um, uh, step. Um, if you're lucky enough to get to there, then you've got to find the real money. Uh, you've got to find an awful lot of, of capital, often from different places where you found the first uh, 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 several slugs of capital. Um, and, then, and then if you're lucky enough to get through clinical trials, you look to, for regulatory clearance to start selling the product, and then, of course, physician development, uh, marketing, and reimbursement. So, so you know, these, are the, these are the basic components that make up any, any, um, any move to marketplace. Um, and I think the big differences between nanomedicine and, and traditional small molecule drug development is in manufacturing and finance. You know, most of us are focused on on very sexy part of drug development, the technology and the data, uh, but it is the non-sexy uh, components that can kill you. Uh, you know, to use to use a, a term that we use in the United States uh, from American football, um, it's the blocking and tackling uh, that are really difficult. I think in nanomedicine, uh, you've got to find a way to manufacture. Uh, these these components consistently and at scale, and then you've got to find a place to make these for you because you almost assuredly can't afford to build it yourself, at least under GLP and GMP conditions. Uh, and that is that is where a lot of people forget um, uh, more, most of the time and money is going to be spent, at least in the early development programs. And then, of course, it's a two-step issue. Uh, you really can't find finance for these for these you know, next generation. Um, compounds without that manufacturing uh, uh, no ability. So, so the farther away a technology moves from traditional small molecule uh, biotechnology, the more difficult these hurdles get. And so I've got a couple of quick examples. Um, one, I, a hopefully successful example, and one uh, challenging example that, that may or may not be successful going forward. Um, uh, Arrowhead, as I mentioned, is, an, is a nanotechnology company that is, that is in RNAi. Uh, we acquired some delivery technology as well as other technology from Roche about two and a half years ago. And the delivery system is polymeric delivery system, uh, whereby we have uh, amine groups up and down the backbone that are masked, and the masking comes off once this is in the endosome of the cell, uh, causing, causing the lysis uh, of the endosome, enabling the, the sRNA to get into the cytoplasm. Uh, the challenges that we saw related to, to moving this from the bench into the clinic and then ultimately in the marketplace were manageable. SRNA synthesis and modifications are well developed and well understood. Um, ARC520, our, our HBV program, is based on a DPC that is a peptide. Uh, it's a normal L amino acid peptide and, and uh, peptide synthesis is well developed and well understood. And so all we needed to do was to prove that we could handle this. In our own hands we could handle this and that we could show activity across uh, multiple models. Uh, and so we did that, and then now, you know, in the two and a half years after we acquired the technology, we've raised about a quarter billion dollars. We've completed a phase one. Uh, we are in a phase 2A that reads out next quarter. We've got a phase 2B that starts in the fourth quarter. We began a new clinical program, and we're positioned to build a number of, of, of candidates on top of, of this platform. But the importance of this is that all that momentum uh, started when we, when, we, when we showed manufacturability, scalability, and reproducibility. Um, there, w there was a fair amount of time during those two and a half years where we were in the forest, we were in the woods, because, because until we showed those things, uh, it was going to be difficult for us to certainly find the financing and the, uh, and the, um, the traction that we needed to move forward. Uh, the other example is with a company called Leonardo Biosystems. This is, this is a company that was started by uh, Mauro Ferrari at the United States. Uh, and it's very interesting technology. It's based on a multi-stage vector drug delivery or MSV drug delivery. The basic idea here is that, is that we have porous or they have uh, porous uh, uh, silicon particles uh, as the first stage delivery and impregnated into those first stages um, are our second stage uh, delivery systems. And so the, so the, 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 the silicon, uh, porous silicon is designed to concentrate in and around tumor vasculature and then to release the second stage. The second stage then is optimized for local action uh, to enter tumor cells and to release the therapeutic agent. Um, importantly, the, the, um, the silicon can be optimized in terms of size and shape, and this is all nanoscale, by the way. It can be optimized uh, uh, by size and shape to really preferentially get into tumors. And so, so it's, it's really fascinating next generation technology that is potentially powerful, uh, I think, and then they even took the, the next step of, of manufacturability. They've spent an awful lot of time uh, trying to understand how to scale up the silicon processing for, uh, for drug development um, um, and have made, have made great strides. Um, and they, as I understand it, um, are ready to, 
to start conversion into a GMP um, type uh, setting. So, so on the face of it, Leonardo had everything that you need for a successful uh, run up in a, in a, in a young company. It's got, it's based on great science. It's got a noted founder in Mauro Ferrari. Uh, he's got literally millions of dollars of ongoing grant support that would funnel into the, into the company. Um, I think at last check close to $50 million of grant funding. Uh, they've got frequent, uh, high, uh, high impact journal, uh, journal articles and uh, presentations. Uh, they've got a critical proof of concept in multiple animal models, and they've got a lead product that is potentially blockbuster if it works in humans. Uh, this, is, uh, this is built on a de-risked business model uh, that is designed to be capital efficient. It's got a first candidate um, with limited compound risk, and there are opportunities for exit and, and partnership, et cetera. Even with all that, it has been a very difficult road to hoe for, for Leonardo, uh, and has not had the capital that it needed uh, because the challenge has been that. The challenge has been this manufacturing and showing the pharmaceutical industry and showing financiers that that this is a viable uh, uh, way to uh, to uh, to build drugs because it's brand new. So, um, uh, you know, in, in in a lot of respects, what is so exciting about that technology and that company is the newness of this technology. But that is what is it has been a, a great challenge for the for that company and for that technology. So. Uh, so in brief, uh, the science uh, is important uh, when, of course, developing uh, new drugs and, and moving them to market. Uh, but you can't reach market until you make that compound a widget. We have to remember that we are, at the end of the day, making stuff to sell. And you need to, to, to focus on that blocking and tackling, on, on making sure you can make that stuff at, at high quantities at a reasonable cost um, uh, before you could expect you really to have uh, something that is marketable. And with that, uh, I can take three minutes of questions, I guess. So I think, you, I think that you have to leave us soon. So, okay. uh, Biat, I'd like maybe to ask you first to uh, ask the first question. Okay, well... Not to put you on the spot. Well, uh, you, you have been out most successful in the last two years. And the question is, what was then the hardest hurdle for you to take? You have shown on a quite generic level what you have to do, but for to become so successful in a pure new technology, for instance, a regulator, was that difficult? Yeah, it was terrible. It was it was awful. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we the the world is awash in in exciting data. Uh, and financiers don't believe that data uh, anymore in, until you've done it a hundred times and until you can until you can start to think about about steps that are going to be taken five years from now. You know the 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 environment has really changed. Um, uh, you know over the last really five years in terms of, of what's required of, of companies. It used to be that that, that something that looked exciting. Uh, would be funded and, and, and again, many things don't work, but at least you'd have the chance of, of uh, pushing it into the clinic and seeing if it worked. Um, now what is required of companies, I think, is, uh, is to show, you know, without a shadow of a doubt that it works at least in multiple animal models. Who knows if it's going to work in humans, but you need to show that it works in multiple animal models and you need to show that, that, that you've thought about you know, all of the, the next, you know, 47 steps that it's going to take to get into market um, and that, that you've got a thoughtful plan to get through those steps and you've got something ultimately that if all the science works can be manufactured on a very large scale and then can be sold. Uh, and so, so we, have, we have been lucky that, that the technology, I think, is, is quite good and we've been diligent in, uh, in taking all the steps and showing that, that, that um, we think we have something special. Actually, may I ask you a quick question? Um, <clears throat> this new caution, how much of it is uh, financially driven? All and of it. Is there any element, uh, you, you will have observed uh, the critical issues around uh, what's been discussed in nature over the last 18 months about irreproducibility of data and the differences of opinion that have been kicked off by Bayer and all of these. Is there any element of that creeping into these, this caution of trust, or is it simply finances? Well, so or is it the same thing? Yeah, yeah, so, so those are related. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I think, so, so the, way, the way 
financiers uh, look at this now, I think, is that, is that A, of course, this is a very expensive process. Um, that really hasn't changed. B, there is less capital available for earlier technology than there used to be. And so, so that's going to make a higher bar to those technologies that, that, do get, that do get financed. And third, there is now, you know, used to be sort of a, you know, uh, a, uh, a bit, you know, a bit of a, of a whisper campaign that, that often, you know, high-impact journal publications weren't reproducible. But now it's not a whisper. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, people talk about this all the time. It's and, screaming. It's screaming. And, and, it's, and, and I don't, and it's, I don't, you know, I don't think, I think that the vast majority of, of scientists are ethical and, and no one's, and, and most people aren't trying to fudge data. But I think that, that there are two, there are two things pushing that. One, you know, the, the funding for basic research is so skinny these days that people are, you know, are, are um, you know, are, are, are really, you know, in jeopardy of losing their labs in, at, at a rate that we've never seen before, I think. Uh, and, and second, you know, people don't report negative data. I think we, we need to find a way to do that. Uh, and so, you know, so if you have a large lab, and when we've experienced this personally, you know, for, for a few different programs we've looked at, if a large lab, uh, you know, with, with many postdocs and, and grad students, techs and such, try something 100 times, that PI will hear about the one or two times that it works and will not hear about the 97 or 98 or 99 times it did not work. And they'll publish based on that. Um, uh, and so, so, you know, when somebody finds, when somebody finds it's not reproducible, uh, that irreproducibility is, is very often not publishable. And so, so that, uh, you know, that technology stays out there uh, without people knowing that, that maybe there, it was a bit, a bit more finicky than, uh, than we used to think. We might be able to come back later and explore that a little bit more. I mean, so one of the questions seems important to me is who's going to pay for reproducibility? Because really it's expensive. It sure is, yeah. And uncertainty is even more expensive. So maybe shall we uh, close off that session? Thank you very okay, thank much you. Thank you. for being so flexible with us.